111.
probably hasn't all flowed in this morning or bumped in this morning or whatever, but uh, it's good to see you in church this morning. Uh, we uh, want to thank this uh, right away, thank the, the folks that uh, helped clean this parking lot up yesterday. That was quite an ordeal. Yeah. But I want to thank Connor and Brother Kendall, and then Matt came in last night and, and poked around a little bit with it. And uh, well, we got a lot of snow. That was about 8 to 10 inches of snow in this parking lot. And by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it was absolute slop. <laughs> by the plow or anything, it was just an absolute mess. But praise the Lord, it didn't really ice last night. So uh, it's still a little wet out there in the parking lot, but it beats ice, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, good to see you in church this morning. I have already laid a message on my heart and anxious to get to it. So I need to pray so we can move on. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it's so good to be here in your house with these, your people today. Lord, I ask that you would lift our burdens today. I pray that you give us a glimpse of eternity, give us a glimpse of heaven. Help us, Lord God, to have our hearts open for your word today. Lord, I, I, I really do pray, Lord God, that you would touch our hearts, touch our lives today, and change us. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling this morning, uh, some not able to be here, others, uh, Lord, even a distance away, but we've been praying for them, and we ask God that you have your hand in their life as well. Now we ask that you bless this service, and pray in Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. <coughs>
Well, let's sing another high one. <laughs> Number 147, let's sing of the wonderful grace of Jesus. Stand with me so we can reach that note. <laughs>
will be having a missions committee meeting, and uh, we're talking about our missions conference that we're going to be having. We're going to do a missions weekend. We're going to do a Saturday night, and then we're going to do a Sunday school, Sunday morning, uh, international dinner following that, and then coming back for either a Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening service, and we'll have missionary speakers in each one of those services. And so we're looking forward to that. We'll get the date to you and get that in the bulletin as well. Very shortly, that's going to be in April, I believe. This is Brother Kendall. It's in April, April, middle of April sometime. And we'll get those, or end of April, we'll get that information to you. Church choir practice tonight at 4.30. This is an important choir practice because we got snowed out uh, on Friday night. Uh, Friday night was interesting because the choir practice, technically, was supposed to start at 6. Yeah. And here it is, it's 4 o'clock and there's no snow. And 4.30 and there's no snow. And people are calling me and said, it's not, I just told them, I said, it's not snowing. <laughs> and I talked to Kendall and I said, you know, I really think, just, maybe we ought to just, maybe just ought to cancel it. And I'm telling you, five minutes later, yeah, it was a, an all-out blizzard. You couldn't, you couldn't see nothing. And so it was very wise to, to, uh, to not have the choir practice. So that makes tonight's choir practice very important. So be here on time, choir, uh, as we continue to work on our, our music and with our cantata coming up as well. Uh, the latest Bible study is at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. And on, uh, where are y'all, what's y'all studying? The Bible. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we study the Bible. Trench coat, wool trench coat, 
hanging out on the rack. And somebody went home with it last week. Hallelujah. So if you did, uh, God bless you. God bless you. I hope you enjoy it. Okay. And, uh, if you to bring it back, I probably could use it. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'll give you my suit jacket and also be super spiritual. Yeah, yeah. go on. Okay, Vacation Bible School volunteer meeting next Sunday after the evening service. If you've been planning on volunteering but have not yet done so, please see Brother Kendall. There are still positions to fill. Uh, a box will be in the lobby for a special VBS offering starting soon. I'm going to maybe start that even uh, today. Today, next. Okay, there is a, a box in the back, and uh, we've talked it over with the deacons, and we've talked it over the VBS meeting. That this is just a great way. Uh, we have money allocated in our budget for VBS. But if you would like to directly be involved in VBS by your contributions, we've got a box there, and you can donate towards VBS. It's uh, it's, it's kind of costly. It can be up to, I think we budgeted a couple thousand dollars for it, and uh, Lord willing, we won't need to use that much. But if you want to help in that way with VBS, start praying about VBS. Do this. I had somebody already uh, tell me, they said, I've already asked my granddaughter to come. It looks like she's going to be able to be here for VBS. If you know some folks, uh, start sort of warming it up a little bit as far as getting kids here for VBS. Uh, we can have the greatest program in the world, but if no kids are here, it, uh, it makes it difficult. We'll do it for one. We'll do it for four. We'll do it for ten. Well, I'll tell you what, if we can do it for 40 or 50, it would be that much better. Than that. So uh, this is coming up. You'll, you'll see other things going on with uh, VBS stompers and chompers and uh, dealing with dinosaurs this next uh, summer. Okay, uh, I already mentioned the Missions Committee meeting and Lord Summer following the evening service. And uh, let, let me mention this uh, as well. I've had a couple of people talk to me about one thing or another like this. If uh, if you if you know for sure that you're saved, you, there's a time when you trusted Christ as your Savior, but you have not been baptized by immersion. Uh, we have a baptistry right here. We have baptismal robes. We'll fill that baptistry and warm it up for you. And it does have a heater. And uh, we'll baptize you. Uh, and just remember, baptism is, not, is a picture of what's already taking place in your heart. It doesn't get you any more saved. It doesn't cleanse you. It doesn't. There's none of that. But the Bible does uh, say that it is a. Uh, it, it is to go parallel. It shows on the outside what's already taking place on the inside. That's right. And uh, and then also, uh, what you would do is you just come forward either during the morning service or you can meet me in, uh, in the hallway or something about that, and we'll set up a time for your baptism. But then secondly, uh, if you'd like to become a member of Crossroads Baptist Church, we have our church constitutions available, and what, this is how that will happen, uh, even at the, uh, at the end of a closing of a service. If you want to come forward and say, we'd like to, I'd like to join Crossroads Baptist Church, uh, qualification for, for joining our church is to be uh, breathing, <laughs> uh, be born again, meaning that there's a time uh, that you can say we can trust in Christ as your Savior, and baptized by immersion. If you meet those three requirements, uh, then uh, what we would do is we give you a copy of our Constitution. You look at our Constitution and make sure that this is what you'd like to do. And then, uh, and then what we would do is have you meet with the deacons for just a moment to give your testimony of your salvation to the to the deacons. And it's really a, a rejoicing time. It's not a it's not a council where you're going to be you know grilled and going to turn a bright light on you or anything. But, uh, and then what we do is then we present that to the church and in the next meeting, and uh, you can become a member of Crossroads Baptist Church. All right, with that said, ushers, why don't you come for our offering? Let's be faithful in our giving. Lord God is faithful. Consider his faithfulness, we too ought to be faithful in our giving the Lord's name. Yeah.
Calvary does cover it all. Yeah. Yeah. Saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. 
and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the scripture that we just read. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your precious life here on this earth. We thank you, Lord, for those 33 years that you dwelt among man in the flesh. You affected all of us in an epic way. I pray, dear God, that you would help us now to understand your word, apply it to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Just to give us some quick, brief background here on uh, where we are in the Gospel of John, uh, you have three, uh, four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, please don't think that I'm shooting low when I'm stopping to say that. You know, there are some people that, that said in our church that didn't have the opportunity, like many of us did, to go to Sunday school or whatever and, and to have an understanding of of where we're going in scripture, I'd like to go back just a little bit and briefly bring us up to speed on where we are. Uh, you have four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and two uh, were written by apostles, which is Matthew and John. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels. It means like if you see this uh, story or you see this incident, in Matthew, you will probably see it also in Mark and in Luke. Maybe from a different angle, maybe a little bit spoken a little differently because there's different people with different backgrounds and a different uh, uh, different views of what happened. But you'll see those called synoptic or synonym. You're going, they're, they're repeated. You see them there. <clears throat> and then you have one that's just called a non-synoptic gospel, which is the gospel of John. And John looked at things, he was called by God to look at things in a little bit different way. Uh, the Gospel of John was the last one of the four Gospels written. Uh, John did most of his writing later on in life. The other disciples and apostles didn't. Does anybody know why? Why they didn't write later on in life? They died. They, died. <laughs> they were martyred. Uh, John was chosen by God to become an elder statesman, to be a link between the actual works of Christ, viewing the actual works of Christ, on into, he was able to take that, what he saw, on into the next generation. Uh, the apostles, the 12 apostles, uh, 11 of them died martyrs' deaths. John's the only one that did it. So the Gospel of John starts a little different than the other Gospels. You don't see any kind of a lineage. You don't see his heritage. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Gospel of John was written with an emphasis on the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Amen. Amen. And so it's a little bit of a different view of things. The other three Gospels are more looking at it through the through the, the through his humanity. Well, the Gospel of John is the Wednesday night crowd. You know where I'm going with that. And then you see the Gospel of John is more about his deity. Although you see both in all of them, we're talking primarily. And so now we see in uh, John chapter one, he's, Jesus is introduced. We see John the Baptist is introduced in his ministry. And then immediately we see Jesus starting to assemble the prominent people that were going to follow him. We refer the, to them as the apostles of the Lamb, the apostles, the 12 apostles. And then we're coming on into chapter 2. Uh, Jesus has not yet really stepped forth and begun his ministry. 
And we see that he's going to this wedding feast and he's invited. And remember now, Jesus grew up. Uh, he spent some of his earliest childhood and he born in Bethlehem, had to flee Bethlehem when he was probably one or two years old and had to flee to Egypt until uh, those that were trying to kill him were dead. And then he came back and uh, 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 Joseph and Mary took and moved to, to, to Nazareth where he grew up in Nazareth sort of a backwater town, uh, just a, a little bit of a, uh, of a community, not with a real good reputation, not known as the sharpest knives in the drawer or brightest bulbs in the chandelier, the people from Nazareth. And you're thinking of some place right now. I'm sure that you are. And, uh, and they, they weren't people of notoriety as far as teachers and uh, education and that sort of thing goes. And, uh, but he grew up there in Nazareth. And we see for 30 years, Jesus lived. For 30 years, he lived. Now, we see a little bit of the supernatural in the sense that, of course, the virgin birth, you don't get much more supernatural than the virgin birth. Okay? Uh, but we see the supernatural there, but then we it's as if the supernatural... If there was supernatural going on, we don't read about it. Jesus was given that opportunity to grow up and be a child and, and uh, uh, to, to, to be go, going through his, uh, what we would say are his elementary school days and into junior high and uh, whatever. And in the Hebrew culture, of course, it was a little bit different than that. But as he grew, he, he learned a trade. He, he uh, learned a trade uh, from his father, Joseph, who was a carpenter. And at that time, a carpenter meant, did not necessarily just mean somebody who, who made furniture or something like that. A, a carpenter was somebody who would be involved in, in uh, building sites and somebody that would be a, a, a handyman, somebody that would... And, and Jesus worked with his hands. For 30 years, uh, Jesus uh, was not known as the Son of God. He was not known for the supernatural. Now, there was a handful that knew. Some shepherds had gotten a clear vision of it. The Magi, the kings from the east, had gotten a vision of it. Uh, and uh, the shepherds did in Christ's birth. They knew something. But then it's almost as if God took him to Egypt. And so now he comes back from Egypt pretty much in obscurity. So now he can be raised without the memory of Bethlehem and the angel chorus and all of that. Uh, he is being raised as a common man. For 30 years, Jesus is raised as a common man. Jesus is seen as a common man. Now, a good man, yes. I mean, if you wanted to have the job done correctly... You'd go get Jesus to do it because he wouldn't cut any corners. He wouldn't cheat you. He would give his very best. And we're talking about the very one who created the universe. I think he could probably help me with my chair. Okay? So I think that Jesus was very much in tune with the craft that he was doing. And very, very much so he was a man, of course, of integrity. There was no sin in Christ. People didn't know that. They just saw him as being somebody who was a good craftsman, somebody that you could trust, somebody that loved and respected his parents, somebody that was uh, faithful to the synagogue, somebody who studied uh, the Word of God and was knowledgeable of the Word of God. I'm sure that he had a reputation of that because the one little glimpse that we see of Jesus is when he was a, a, young, uh, a young man where he went to the temple. Okay, and they lost. Can you imagine? They lost. Jesus. <laughs> I mean, talk about adding the tension. You know, if you if you misplaced your 13-year-old son, you went down to Detroit, and somehow you thought he was riding with somebody else, and he wasn't, you got home to Inlay City, and where's our son? Well, then you compound that with the fact that this is the Savior of the universe. And they lost him. Mary knew that. Joseph knew who Jesus was. And they lost it. But where was Jesus? Jesus was in the temple, and he was teaching, and he was, uh, uh, he was, they, they were just shocked that this young man had such wisdom, such understanding of Scripture, 
John chapter 1 and verse 1 will tell you why. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was the very Word of God. Of course, he had wisdom, insights into the Word of God that others, it'll take all eternity for us to get. He already knew those things. And so uh, that's really the only thing. So they knew that he was a good young man. We knew that uh, they knew that he was someone you could count on. These are aspects of his character. But we don't see evidences of the supernatural. I looked up the word supernatural. And it comes from two words. Really? Can you guess what the two words they are? <laughs> Super and natural. What a, what a crowd. You all are brilliant. Supernatural. Super and natural. Being beyond or exceeding the powers or laws of nature. Miraculous. Now, no human being can alter a law of nature. This is found in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. For instance, the floating of iron on water, therefore, must be caused by divine power, specially exerted to suspend, in this instance, a law of nature. Hence, supernatural events or miracles can be produced only by the immediate agency of divine power. Supernatural. They didn't see, in those whole 30 years, they didn't see the super. For 30 years, they saw a great exhibition of the natural. And now that brings us to John chapter 2, where we see Jesus is now stepping forward. Remember he told his mother, it's not time yet. And then mom, in her passive-aggressive way, told the servants, do as he says. In other words, yeah, I know what he's going to do. And uh, he went ahead and, and performed this miracle. Uh, you notice in Scripture many times, and we're not going to take time to look at these places, but those of you who have studied the Gospels, many times Jesus would come and he would, uh, like he healed the leper. And then the leper was just so ecstatic, so excited, and Jesus said, don't, don't tell no man. Don't, don't tell anybody. And the guy said, going, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And you don't want me to tell me, but I, I got a feeling he told some people. Okay, I think he let it slip a few times. Especially the fact that he had his fingers back and his nose was in place and he had both ears. Probably, probably let people know that something special, something supernatural had happened. Uh, there was a time that we know for 30 years you had a great display of the natural, but you didn't see the supernatural. We, uh, uh, do the math on that. Jesus spent ten times the time building the foundation of the natural before he spent one-tenth of his life doing the supernatural. Okay? If he went for 30, and he lived to be 33... Okay, and, and he, he, was, uh, he was crucified when he, at age 33. Uh, the scripture tells us that. And uh, let's see, I think I have that written down where that even is. Uh, I've got it written down here somewhere. Uh, Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. And it talks about how much time Jesus had lived on this earth for these 33 years. 30 of it was spent doing the natural. Ten times the three years that he did the supernatural. Now I believe that of course we don't parallel Christ in this sense. He had a mission. God uh, the Father had presented him with a mission. He had submitted himself to, the Holy, to, 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 to his Holy Father and was working in the power of the Holy Spirit. We see the Trinity coming together as Jesus was on this earth. And there's only one Jesus Okay, there's only that was a supernatural occurrence that will never uh, be duplicated. Uh, there is one God man, and that is Jesus Christ. But there are some lessons that we can learn about doing and seeing the supernatural. 
The supernatural was placed upon many years of nondescript natural behavior. There was a lot of natural before there was the display of the super. Now, I would like to see the supernatural. <clears throat> we pray for the supernatural. We pray for healing. We pray for our country. I hope that you pray for our country. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for our friends. We pray for our lost loved ones. We pray for those who are in the hospital. Matt, we need something supernatural for Katie. There's no. We need something supernatural for Rose. We need something supernatural. Oh, I've got issues in my life. We need the supernatural. What that means is God's got to come down and alter the natural course of things and readjust them and, and do something special to do the supernatural. And we pray to that end and we desire that. Um, I would love to see our nation experience a revival, but that's never going to come from the natural. There is no way, there is no recipe that we can concoct and put together that's going to bring about revival for our nation. That's supernatural. It's a, that by even by definition of revival becomes something that only God can do. But does that mean that we have uh, no input whatsoever? Does that mean that we have no part in the supernatural? When we see Jesus laboring for 30 years in the natural to be displayed for three years in the supernatural, that tells me that the natural that we are caused to do is of great importance to bring them about the supernatural. I really wonder whether Jesus' greatest Days, and now we understand there's no word. The, the, this sacrifice on the cross, of course, is, is the moment for Christ and the resurrection, the death, death, and resurrection of Christ, which makes up the gospel. But I'm wondering, and all the healing, and all the, like it says here, turning water into wine, and raising people from the dead, and all those things that Jesus did, I wonder if we could really see into what took place for those 30 years of anonymity, I wonder if some of the most spectacular things that Jesus did, we don't even know about yet because they happened in the 30 years where he was acting as a natural man. There's some, there's some blessing in the natural. Man. There's something holy about the natural. Do you mean that Jesus wasn't holy until he turned the water into wine? Of course not. So what was going on those previous years? There was, there was consecration and there was holiness and there was preparation and there was ministering and there was all kinds of things that went on for that ten times the three years of his supernatural. And I wonder if those natural years may in some ways eclipse, eclipse the supernatural years. We'll find that out someday. Now, with that in mind, I, that's really what I was trying to just set up this morning, is the idea that the supernatural is God's, and the natural is ours. God does not require that we do something supernatural. Oh my goodness, I wish I could intervene. I wish I could intervene in some situations and do the supernatural. But God has not called me to do the supernatural. God understands that I am but dust. All I can do is what I can do. But I better do what I can do. That's right. Amen. That doesn't minimize what I'm supposed to be doing. Matter of fact, as I was saying, we wonder about those 30 years what that really meant with, with, for Jesus. I wonder what the natural work that God has caused us, called us to do 
affects the supernatural work that God wants to do. Okay? So, I, this is really sort of a loose kind of a message. That's really my thought. You understand what I mean? That's the thought. We could, we could almost close with that, but you know, you're not so lucky. Okay? We could almost close with that. But here, here's just some thoughts that go along with that. Often, God requires a natural action before performing the supernatural. Okay, can you imagine this? Put yourself in the position of the, uh, the children of Israel. They're leaving Egypt, and finally God has done the work, and uh, Pharaoh has released them, and now they're <coughs> heading to the promised land. And you know what Moses does? God leads them through Moses right to a dead end on the Red Sea. You know, if, it was, if there was a GPS, it would be saying, rerouting, 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 make a U-turn, make a legal U-turn, you know, turn left, make a legal U-turn, you know. And so here they are, they're there. And Pharaoh rises up, the Bible says, I just read it just, I think this morning, uh, 600 of his best charioteers and chariots. These are the war machines. And they're going to, now they're going to attack the children of Israel and bring them back into bondage. And so you're looking over here, you got the Red Sea. Looking over here, you got Pharaoh with 600 chariots coming down on him, with chariots of iron. And the people are looking one way or another. And of course, they look to Moses and say, Moses, what have you done to us? Now, you know what Moses needed? Moses did not need the natural. Moses needed, listen, Moses needed God to do something supernatural. Isn't it just like God to put us in positions like that where we can't get out of it ourselves? And it turns our hearts to God and say, God, what do you say? Help! And so that's what they did. They were murmuring against Moses. They were upright. The people, they were chaos. And so this is what God said to do to them. Moses, he said, just sort of step back here. We're going to, well, I'm going to part the water. Is that what he told him? Mm -hmm. That's not what he told him. This is what he said. He said, lift up your rod and stretch forth thy hand. So in one hand, he's got his rod. and the other, he's stretching forth his hand, and I'm assuming very likely over the water. When he lifted up his rod and stretched forth his hand, what happened? The, 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 the water's parted. Do you think that God needed Moses to lift up his rod, stretch forth his hand for God no. to be able to do a miracle? It's like, okay, this is like abracadabra. We got to have this. We got to have this. You know, we got to have uh, this part of uh, you know the skin of a toad, and we need this over here to, to mix into this big kettle of stuff and the match wings, and we're going to mix this all up and hocus pocus. You know, poof, the, then it parts. Does God need Mo No, but he chose to tell Moses, this is what you do. A very natural thing. This is something that was in his wheelhouse, something that he had energy, strength, know-how to do. A child could have done it. Lift up the rod and stretch forth your hand. But God told Moses, that's what I want you to do. And as soon as Moses did that, the waters parted. I want to say something to you this morning. That had Moses not lifted up the rod, stretched forth his hand, God would not have parted the water. That's right. Amen. He wouldn't have parted the water. Sometimes God is requiring a natural action before performing the supernatural. We see this in Joshua chapter 3. Uh, now it's time they've wandered in the wilderness for these 40 years. This whole generation is now dead that, uh, that refused to, uh, to go into the promised land earlier. And so now Joshua is leading them and God has called him. Now the problem is they got another river to cross. They've got to cross the Jordan River. I just saw recently, I had several friends that were in Israel. I had one, I guess it was vacation time in Israel. I had three or four pastor friends who were sending me pictures of Israel. And uh, several pictures of the Jordan River. Well, the Jordan River is only about that deep. Where they were, where they say where Jesus was baptized, it's only about that deep, maybe that deep. So I'm thinking, what's the big deal about the Jordan River? The Bible tells us it was during flood time. 
and uh, there was no no dams, no man-made anything there, and so it was it was a torrent. They couldn't just walk across that. And so God said, I'm going to, you're going to just go across the Jordan River. And in Joshua 3 and verse 15, we see something interesting. God had told them, he said, take the, take the, uh, uh, the, the priests that are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, they've got to remember, they've got it on their shoulder. Something probably about the size of this pulpit turned this way. And they've got rods going through it. It's resting upon the shoulders of the priests. And they've got all of their garments on. They're all, they're, they're all they're sanctified. They're holding this before the Lord and all that sort of thing. And now he said, okay, uh, Ark of the Covenant goes first. The water is still there. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if these guys did this who are holding the Ark. I wonder if they did this. <laughs> Go, guys. Very natural thing to step forward. Not with something that's made out of gold, which weighs an awful lot, on your shoulder, stepping into a raging torrent of a river. But the Bible says here, and I'll get that verse for you again, in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible says that the river did not dry up and part and, and sort of pile up in a heap until the very sole of the priest's foot touched the water. Wow. That's a good man. You know, Joshua said, no. Everybody said, what are they waiting for? <laughs> and they're one. <laughs> now, let's not over-spiritualize it. I think those guys were a little nervous. Yeah. And so when they went to put their foot down, if it would have been me, I'd have been doing this. <laughs> as soon as the sole of their foot touched the water, the Bible says that the water parted. And they walked across on the right ground. Man. I believe this. Had they not taken the step, the natural step, God would not have done the supernatural act of parting the water. That's right. So you don't have to part the water. Their foot did not part the water any more than uh, the rod of Moses and the hand of outstretched hand of Moses parted the water. God parted the water. Man. But he said, this is what I want you to do. For some reason, God wants us to be a part of what he's doing. It's an exercise of faith. As I'm on his team, I can remember carrying things with my dad. My dad was five foot six at his tallest. When he went to heaven, he was about five foot three, five foot two. He lost a lot of his height. And a uh, great staggering height that he had. And but I could, my dad worked like he was six foot two. And uh, he did. My dad was a hard, hard worker. But I can remember, like, my dad would haul a sheet of plywood. And, you know, there's not a way, to, a way to get a hold of a sheet of plywood or drywall and be able to carry it, balance it by yourself. And uh, uh, he, my dad knew all of those things. And he'd always say this, come on, Jeff, give me a hand. Well, here I am. <laughs> Dad's got it. But my dad was wise enough to include me in his work. Amen. So I was feeling like that's something, that's part of me. That's, I'm, I, I helped. I did that. Look at what we did. Hey, hey, son. And then he would say, hey, let's go tell your mom what we got done. I did almost nothing. Okay, but he included me in that. Isn't that much what God does? Yeah. God doesn't need us, but God wants us. Amen. God wants us not to do the supernatural. He's got that covered. But what he's asking us to do is the natural, which opens the gate to the supernatural. I need to see some supernatural things. I can't do them myself. In Matthew chapter 12, and verse 13, the man with the withered hand all dried up and, and palsied perhaps, and that hand like this. When Jesus went to heal him, what did he say? Does anybody know? Stretch forth your hand. Can you imagine the look on that guy's face? Just like, like. Stretch forth my hand. I can't stretch. Do you not see? Are you mocking me? You see, if he would have never stretched forth his hand, he would have never been healed. That's right. The natural brought about the supernatural, and as he as he went to stretch forth his hand, was him stretching forth his hand? Was that what brought about? Was that the healing? No. 
his obedience to what God was telling him to do in the person of Jesus Christ brought about the supernatural. Amen. We see it time after time, New Testament, Old Testament. We see these sort of things. Uh, in John chapter 9 and verse 7, this is one of the weirdest healings that Jesus did. I, it, it, where, where there was a blind man, and so Jesus goes out and he spits in the dirt and makes blood with the dirt. He spits in the dirt. How oh, humiliating. The guy couldn't see him do it. <laughs> and then takes some, gets some of that mud and puts it on his thumbs and rubs it on the, rubs the mud on that guy's eyes. And then he says, do this, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he goes out to the pool of Siloam and when he washes the mud away, his healing, his eyes are restored. Was there anything miraculous in the in him going and washing the spittle mud out of his eyes? No, that would be something that we would want to do naturally as soon as possible. Get that guy's spitty mud out of my eyes. But because he did what Jesus told him to do, he did what would be the natural, Jesus was able to perform the supernatural. I mean, we could, we could go over and over and over and over and over. Will thou be made whole? He asked the guy sitting there at the pool. He'd been there for 38, he'd been 38 years? Yeah. Is what it is? Yeah. And he asked him, will thou be made whole? As if the guy had something to do with it. Hmm. Jesus said, rise, take up your bed and walk. I wonder if that man would have just shook his head and said, you know, I can't. Now, he wouldn't still be sitting there, but he'd have died sitting there. Jesus asked him, you do the, if you're willing to obey me in the natural, you give me the opportunity then to be able to do something supernatural for you. Man. It's, it's repeated over and over. The natural was followed by the supernatural. Now, there are times where God just, and supernatural happened. So it's not to say that that never was the case. But uh, uh, often God requires a natural action before performing the supernatural. Now, also, God often uses those who are doing the natural to be blessed by the supernatural. It's like the master, the story of the master who goes away and he gives, he gives, uh, uh, he gives to, to, the, to, 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 his, to his servants. And, and he says, here, I'm going to go away for a while, occupy till I come. That means I want you to be doing something. Be doing something with what I've given you. Do something with it. When we're just setting the person who was condemned, the person who doubled the money wasn't somebody who was condemned. It was the person who did nothing that wound up with being condemned. So, well, I can't do much. Do something. Do something. So wait a second now. Wait a second, Pastor. You don't understand. You don't understand my limitations. You don't understand my weaknesses. No, I don't understand your limitations, and I don't understand your weaknesses. Somebody does, and he expects each of us to do something. Amen. So I can't do the supernatural. Well, get in line. Neither can anybody else. Sometimes it's hard enough just to get out of bed in the morning, but get out of bed. Sometimes it's all, it seems like an impossibility to pray. Well, pray anyway. Do what you can. So I can't pray for hours like Jesus did. Well, pray for a couple of minutes then. Do something. Be doing something. That's right. What was Moses doing when he saw the burning bush? He was tending sheep. What was Zacharias doing? Ministering in the temple as an old man. When the angel came and said, you're going to have a son and his name's going to be John. And he said, doubted. So you've got to be kidding me. 
He said, your prayer has been answered. And he's thinking, what prayer? I haven't prayed that prayer in years. I'm well beyond. My wife and I are well beyond that age. And there's no way that this can take place. But you know what Zacharias uh, did every day? He got up and did what he was supposed to do. He got up and did what he could do. He couldn't perform a supernatural act. But he could do a natural act, which is get up, go where he was supposed to go, and do what he was supposed to do. I got a list here. Uh -oh. I've got several more points, but maybe we'll do that tonight. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not smart. I'm not healthy. I'm not wealthy. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Do you know that God does not expect you to be something that you're not? And he knows better than you do what you are and what you're capable of. My excuses mean absolutely nothing to God other than I'm struggling. <coughs> because God knows what I'm capable of. I don't even know fully what I'm capable of. So I don't have that ability or I don't have... Well, can you make sure that there's salt on the sidewalk on Sunday morning? So somebody doesn't slip and break their skull or their hip or something? Well, that's not much. It's something you can do. Hey, I, you know, I really don't have much gifts or abilities or talents or ground. Well, can you clean the bus? Can you go with a broom on the bus and sweep the bus up, wipe the seats down to make sure that our friends who ride on the bus have a clean bus to get in and out? Well, I couldn't teach a VBS class. Can you count pennies? Do what you can do. Hallelujah. Uh, how about this? <laughs> Rather than. <laughs> then somebody new comes in the door of a church. <laughs> <laughs> they better not sit in my seat. You better to run and put your family sized Bible down right there to make sure they don't sit in your seat. And I sat in Vicky's chair this morning before Sunday school. Oh boy, she was throwing daggers at me. <laughs> she knew I wasn't going to sit there, so really she was okay. But... Hey, maybe you can smile and wave at your neighbor every now and then. Man. I mean, I got to tell you a story, don't be done. I'm lying right there, but I got it. I got up yesterday morning, and my wife and I were reading her Bible together. She looked out the window and she said, honey, there's somebody broke down and parked right out in front of our driveway. He's right in front of our driveway. Well, here, I got to get up and go plow. And there's a car abandoned in the middle of our driveway, this way, blocking our driveway. And I'm, first thing I'm thinking, you know what I'm thinking? What kind of a goofball would park his car like that? How am I supposed to plow this driveway? <laughs> okay, and as I'm looking at that, I went down there and I was able to sort of just barely get around and just start punching it out. I didn't know who was going to be coming in. I wanted to maybe get access to the, to the building. And you know, I saw a note down there and I got out and looked at the note and it said, Sorry, please do not tow while we're back in the morning. <laughs> broke down and with the guy's address it's our neighbor two driveways up now, I'm going to tell you something it's like the Holy Spirit of God man. you big dummy uh -huh. I read that that's my neighbor I've never met my neighbor I've never gone down there and knocked on that guy's door conviction came into me you know what God's expecting me to do? The natural. So I looked down and I was, honestly, I saw his address. I was, was going to go down and see if he needed some help. I finally went, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> I need to calm down here. Because the guy's car broke down. I probably shouldn't have parked it crossways across the end of our driveway. But that's where it is. He lives right down here. I need to go down and say something to him. Something nice. <laughs> I can kind of help you out what you need. Now I was getting in the car to go do that when a, when a van pulled in. And there was a, another guy that lives right down the road here. Same, I think right in the same apartments there. And uh, it was this guy's dad. And he was going like this. Oh, he said, please don't tow it. 
I don't know what's going on with my boy. I don't know what's happening here. I, uh, we'll try to get it out of there as soon as we possibly can. So I met the man's dad. Anyone was able to say, hey, Kendall was right there, Connor was right there. Uh, you know, I got a tow strap. Could I maybe get it to your house for you? Instead of being, I'm saying God has laid an opportunity in front of me. I didn't see it because I just wanted to get the driveway plowed. I didn't see that God was right there giving me an opportunity to do the natural so he could do the supernatural. Now, they don't know it yet, but I'm coming to their house. <laughs> and I'm the guy that didn't blow up at them, but offered to try to help them get their car moved. They owe me a little bit of civility. <laughs> So when I knock on the door, he's going to recognize me. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, I really didn't even introduce myself. I'm Pastor Newfo. What is your name? And I'm going to get to know my neighbor. Now, you see, I couldn't go, you know, hocus pocus, out hocus, move this God and have him move this truck. <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. Why? Because... God wanted something more natural. Man. Which is, hey, man, can I give you a hand? Well, what's going on? Well, that's tough. I'm sorry to hear that your car broke down. You tried to sell it to me for 200 bucks. Huh. You said I'd get 300 for it at the scrapyard. Would you, would you buy it for two? And my mind clicked a little bit. I think I <laughs> But he was pretty disgusted with his vehicle. See, folks, what I was first seeing as a natural a natural, yeah, not a disaster, but a natural, just sort of a uh, difficulty, natural, like, uh, come on, this is a problem. I can't plow. I'm going to wind up hitting this guy's car. I can't get in and out of it. And God said, no, 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 you just do the natural. Do the natural. Do what you can do. Now, I get to say to God, now, God, can you do the supernatural? Can you do something here? God, I, I, I made this contact with these people. Can you go before me, Holy Spirit, and minister to their hearts? Because nobody gets saved because I want them to. People get saved because they are drawn to Christ by the Holy Spirit of God. It's supernatural. I cannot do that, but I can offer to give the guy a tow to his house or help him start his truck. Why? Because that's the natural that I can do. Amen. Folks, there's all kinds of natural things that we can do <clears throat> that opens the gate for the supernatural. See, duties are mine, events are God's. Duties are mine, events are God's. Let's do what we can. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this message this morning. Lord, that very simple illustration, Lord, of what happened right here in our own parking lot yesterday. Uh, Lord, there's something that if we can get a hold of, dear God, dear God, we might see more supernatural. Help us, Lord, to do the natural. Lord, we know that this church needs the financing that we can't afford, but God, what we're supposed to do is just do what we can, do the natural. And you'll do the supernatural. Trust you. You, did, you make up the difference. Lord, we don't know what's going to happen with this building over here in this corner. But well, I'm, not, I'm not worried about it. Well, this is your building. We'll do the natural. We'll do everything we can. We expect you to do the supernatural. Lord, as we send money and help to our missionaries, we're not expecting our missionaries to, see, to bring about great revival where they are. But Lord, we're expecting maybe that you can if we do the natural. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor... I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Let me tell you something. That is not natural. There's no way that you can get to heaven naturally. By nature, we are all sinners. Every person in this room, the most saintly person, the most degenerate, we are all sinners. Man, woman, young, old, whatever our background is, we are all without hope because getting to heaven is supernatural. Maybe you here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm going to go to heaven, but I sure would like to know. 
Can you please pray for me? Is there anyone like that? Just slip your hand up quickly. Nobody else is looking around. I'm saying nobody else is looking around. You'd say, Pastor, I don't know for sure, but I would like to know. Would you please pray for me? See, that's something that you can do. That's a natural thing that you can do. You can raise your hand. You can say, I need help. That opens the door to the supernatural. Yeah. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need for God to renew my vision of what I can do to help accomplish supernatural things. Pastor, please pray for me. Is there anyone like that this morning? My, my, many hands this morning. God bless you. God bless you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless those who have raised their hand. Lord, I think of what goes on downstairs in this basement on Tuesday with the very precious seed. And God, all we're doing is the natural. We're putting together scriptures. But God, I pray that it would open the door to the supernatural where hundreds and thousands would come to Christ. Lord, through that ministry, Lord, I pray that you bless our church. Help us to stay faithful. Lord, in whatever responsibilities we have or whatever we can see, help us, Lord, to be a good neighbor. Help us to reach out to the poor, to the homeless, and to the sick and the infirm. Lord, help us, God, to uh, not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, uh, but to present the gospel and be a faithful witness. Lord, help us to do the natural so that you can unlock the supernatural. Now, Lord, we ask that you bless this invitation. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand for it.